eyes on Easter where we're walking through uh, these gospel texts and we're uh, reading them and learning about them and understanding them through the lens of Easter, sort of looking backwards and then, and then, and then forwards again. And this was kind of a, a, uh, a popular one, John 3.16. Many of us have, have heard that before. And so uh, Larry did a great job of reading it, and I'm going to uh, break it down. We're going to kind of go section by section and see what we can learn here about, about Jesus, about ourselves, uh, and, and about what Jesus is, is doing on Easter. So here we're going to start here with this first little section. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So I want to take a moment here to talk about this uh, Moses lifting up the snake business. Like this, what, what the, that's not the part of the verse that any of us probably have memorized, is this whole lifting up the snake in, in the wilderness. And so this actually comes, if we're going to, going to talk about Moses, we have to go back to the Old Testament. And this is in the book, in the book of, of Numbers. Numbers uh, chapter, uh, where are you? Chapter 21. And I'll read it here. It's, it, this episode here is pretty short. Um, the original name for the book of Numbers, we call it Numbers in English. Uh, the original Hebrew, the Jewish name, they would call it In the Wilderness. So it's stories of Israel in the wilderness, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness. And so uh, I'll read it here. And it's strange and unusual, as many things happen to be. Uh, but we'll talk about it a little bit and what we can learn. They, the Israelites, traveled from Mount, uh, from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom. But the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no bread. There is no water. We detest this miserable food. Uh, then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, we sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. We pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord, God, said to Moses, Make a snake and put it on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and he put it on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, they lived. So this is Old Testament. This is what's happening in the wilderness. And obviously there are many questions you may have about what's happening here. And we're not going to answer all of them today. Because the, then the sermon would be four times as long probably. We're just going to focus on, on, on a few key points. And maybe sometime in the future we'll do a numbers sermon series. And, and we can all be uh, uh, overjoyed to learn how much awesome things are happening here. In Numbers 21. Uh, so the first thing, this bronze serpent here, this bronze snake. And in that story, we heard that the Israelites sinned by losing faith in God. God had, within their generation, all of these people had been part of God uh, liberating them from slavery in Egypt in a miraculous way. The whole parting of the Red Sea thing has already happened in their lives. All of these plagues in Egypt and all of the, the ways that God miraculously acted personally in their lives has all happened. And now they're out in the wilderness on the way to the land that God has promised them that they will inhabit. And they're as all of us, as people are prone to do, they're complaining. And, and they don't like the circumstances that they're in. And they start to lose faith that God is actually going to do the things that he said he would do, even though they have been witness to all of these miraculous events so far in their life. So there's this sin. where We just had our confession of sin. And sin, as uh, I say most weeks, is us damaging the relationship between ourselves and others and between ourselves and God. And that's exactly what's happening here with the Israelites. They sin. They lose, uh, lose faith in God. 
Sin is a big problem for us, and it's a big problem for God, and we'll, we'll talk more about that here today. Uh, but for this episode, they have sinned. They've lost faith in God. The result of their sin is their dying. Sin is literally killing them. The consequences of their actions <laughs> is causing them physical, real death. This is uh, bad news. It's not uh, just, uh, it's not even so like I've sinned against someone and I feel bad and their feelings are hurt. You know, that's bad enough. Like they're being bitten by snakes and dying because of, as a result of their sin. So this is real life or death uh, consequences that these people find themselves in the wilderness. And so God, the way that God works is God made a way for them to be saved from the death of their sin. God asks uh, Moses to you know, make this serpent thing, and, and then uh, they're asked to look at the snake. Take your eyes off the snakes and, and put your eyes up here on where God is asking you to look. Return your gaze to the Lord, and you'll be saved from the death of your sin. Again, we could talk about this, probably this number, this little story for several sermons. Uh, and so this is all you get today. Wah, 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 sorry, but <laughs> uh, if you have really big questions, we can talk about it afterwards, that's for sure, because there are some weird things that happen here. Um, but uh, for today, what we want to get out of this Numbers 21 business, this snakes in the wilderness business, that Jesus sees this as a way to help uh, Nicodemus, the person he's talking to, and to help us understand what he's doing on Easter. Jesus is speaking to a religious leader when he's saying these things, and this religious leader would no doubt understand completely that Jesus is referring to this episode in their history. And Jesus is saying, well, that's, you know the thing that Moses did and God had him do? Uh, that's what I'm doing here, too, right? So it's, they have a, this shorthand that they could speak because they both are super smart uh, Bible nerds and they know all their stuff, and so they can speak this way to each other. All that to say that Jesus sees what's happening here as a way to help us have our eyes on Easter and help us understand what's, uh, what's going on there in Easter. We'll continue on here in John chapter 3. Jesus continues uh, by saying, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. We can start seeing a little bit of the links right back to this, this story that happens in Numbers, the story in the wilderness. But what can we learn uh, specifically here uh, that we see in this passage? All have sinned. This is uh, the Apostle Paul writes in a book, in a letter to a church in Rome. All have sinned. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so we understand that all have sinned and are therefore condemned. Our default state is sin. Uh, it's uncomfortable uh, preaching about sin. But I would only ask you, if, if I say that our default state, and notice I say our, not your, our default state is sin, I would say that each and every one of us only has to think back, probably within an hour's time, uh, to find that maybe there was something we could have done differently. Maybe there's some evidence that we have not loved uh, God with our whole heart and not loved our neighbor as ourselves sometime this morning. You don't have to confess it to me. We just did it, but I would probably guess that we all have that. And so that's just a reality. It's a reality we don't like to talk about because it makes us feel uncomfortable. It's a reality we don't like to talk about because we have attached other feelings to this. We have attached shame. We have attached all of these negative views of ourselves every time we attach sin, every time we say the word sin, pretty much. These things boil up in us. And so it's, it's a 
preachers, it's a pastor's job to talk about sin and to tread lightly, <laughs> right? So that people can still hear, hear the message. But uh, much like you all have been so kind to turn off your cell phones, I think you would all be so kind as to agree with me that probably, for sure, our default state is sin. We have to try really hard to love our neighbor and to love God. Sinning comes pretty easy to us. It comes pretty easy uh, to me, that's for sure. And so that's, that's uh, our default state. Jesus, however, offers a way out of this. Jesus says that he's doing the thing the serpent in the wilderness does, the staff with the snake. That's Jesus. Jesus is here offering a way out of this sin. It's awesome because though our default state is sin, uh, Jesus offers us an opportunity to uh, become in the future uh, people whose default state is not sin. Jesus is is our is our way our way out of this. It's uh, much like talking about sin is something that many churches try to avoid. Talking about the exclusivity of Jesus is something that many churches try to avoid because we want to say, well, how do I know this person is not saved because they're a really good person and they do really good things? But as you and I have all agreed on, their default state is also state is also sin even though they may do really good things. And we say, well, we don't know what's in a person's heart. We don't know that they're not saved. I suppose that's true. But Jesus is explicit here that his, uh, the only way to salvation is through him. He's here to, to offer this way out for all of us. This is good news for us. We should be happy that we have a way and not sad that maybe sometimes we don't like the way <laughs> So then there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Again, this is a way that the Apostle Paul would, would say is Christ Jesus Christ. So J- Jesus' last name is not Christ. He's not Jesus Christ. Christ is a title. It uh, goes back to the Hebrew word for Messiah. It means anointed one. Jesus is the anointed Messiah, Savior of the world, who has come to offer us a way out of our default state of sin. So Christ Jesus is a way to say Messiah Jesus. It's not sort of like, I don't know, in school when they call your last name first or something. (laughs) This is Jesus' title. But there's no condemnation, Jesus says, for those that have put their faith on Jesus, those that keep their eyes on Easter. Their default state uh, kind of becomes irrelevant for anyone that is part of the body of Christ, anyone that keeps their eyes on Easter. So Jesus has come for our salvation. Again, it's not, Jesus has not come for our condemnation. That doesn't mean that there is not condemnation, but the point of Jesus being here is for our salvation. Though we may be uncomfortable with the fact that Jesus is the one and only way to salvation, Uh, though much of the world may be uncomfortable with the fact, that doesn't mean it's not true. And so Jesus has come to offer us a way, much like when we read in the book of Numbers and we say, well, why in the world would God save people by putting a bronze snake on a pole and they got to look at it? Why didn't God do it some other way? Why didn't God just uh, destroy all the snakes magically? Why didn't God uh, just destroy all of the questions that we could have about why God chose uh, to deal with the sin of the Israelites that way. We have those same questions about the exclusivity of Jesus. We have those same questions about what salvation, the path to salvation looks like. Those are valid questions, but it doesn't mean that God doesn't love us, and it doesn't mean that just because we may not like the answer (laughs) that it's not true. Jesus has come for our salvation. Again, this is, this is good news for us. So here's our last little section here of, of John chapter 3. Once again, this is Jesus speaking. This is the verdict, Jesus says. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. 
Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for they fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. This is the verdict Jesus talks about. Because we are sinning, we like darkness. We like darkness because it's what we're used to, because that's sort of our default state. We don't want our deepest, darkest fears, sins, secrets exposed. Um, And even if we take it again out of the realm of sin, and just maybe we don't like that word. And so maybe we say the things within us that we are not the most happy about, the most proud of, and the things within us that we would never want anyone to ever find out about, those (laughs) are the things we don't want exposed uh, to the light. And so we like the darkness. We like to keep those things hidden because we have attached shame to those things, because we have attached guilt, because, because, because. Because our default state is sin and we are sinning, we love the darkness. That's what we're used to. It's kind of where we feel at home, right? In our default state. Life in Jesus is life in light. Almost, uh, uh, you, you turn on the light and the cockroaches scatter, right? that sort of thing. Life in Jesus is, is an exposed life in the light. All of those things that we hold within us that we are afraid and ashamed of um, because we feel that their exposure would alter our lives forever in a very negative way. Those things in a life in Jesus, are exposed to the light. They're exposed to Jesus. And so living a a life in the light is living face to face with God. It's stepping into the light. Saying, I'm here, God. You you see the mess you're working with here, Lord? (laughs) But it's life in the light. You're, You're face to face with God, and those things become exposed. That can be uncomfortable. That can be hard. And that's why uh, Jesus says that there are some that are standing condemned. Because not everyone is able to stand in the light. We know that if we accept Jesus and we have the power of the Holy Spirit in our life, then it's the Holy Spirit that sort of holds our hand in the light. It's almost like uh, uh, if, if you're, if you're uh, in a in a two-parent household, and the dad is the taskmaster and the mom's the, the mushy one. And well, kids know, I'm, i got to go tell mom what I did wrong, and then mom can come up, oh, we got to tell your father, right, that sort of thing. Tell him, you know, and, and then mom said, don't blow up at him, right, that sort of thing. <laughs> that's, that's the Holy Spirit in our life. Now, okay, we we got to come, we're, we're going. He already knows. You know, isn't that the weird thing? Your kid does something like you already know what they did. You're just like, let's clear the air here. Like I can see the crayon on the wall. Like I know it wasn't me. It wasn't your mom. (laughs) You did it. We all know. So we're kind of all just living in the light here together. And that's what happens. The Holy Spirit here uh, is our helper and standing in the light and being exposed and living a life face to face with God. We're not even concerned for the moment of living a life face-to-face with other people. That's part of the process of becoming a disciple. We're only concerned for the moment here with living face-to-face with God. And so life in the light is a life face-to-face with God, where we are exposed. and God sees our sin and still loves us. In the same way that the parents bring the child together and there's, it's not condemnation. It's not uh, punishment for punishment's sake, if that's the, the uh, consequence of writing on the wall, that sort of thing. It's love. It's love for love's sake. It's I love you so much that I want this air to be clear between us. This needs to be clean between us. 
And so just like parents offer a way uh, for children to do this, God offers a way for us to approach him through the power of the Holy Spirit and the, in the uh, sacrifice that Jesus will make on Good Friday and resurrection when we keep our eyes on Easter. God sees our sin and still loves us. This is not about condemnation. When we talk about sin in the church, it's not to talk about uh, how you're a horrible person or how we're better than those people because we do different sins than them. It's to talk about God's love. It's to say, you've got a way now. This is a, a loving thing that's happening. We're exposing these things to the light. You can live in the darkness if you choose, but God offers you a life in the light. A, light, a life face-to-face -face with God where God sees your sin and still loves you. The reality is as God sees your sin even if you're not in Jesus and still loves you. God still loves you. So we're not talking about God's disposition towards you. If you were the only person on earth, God would still have sent his one and only son to save you. So we're not talking about how much God loves you. We're talking about a way out of the sin problem that we're all in. And that's why Jesus has come, has come for our salvation. So we're going to talk about life in the light. No, what it means to live a life in the light. And a life in the light is acknowledgement of our sin. It's what we did a moment ago. It's getting real uh, with ourselves and confessing the fact first to ourselves that we have sinned, that we are sinning. It's understanding that this is the reality. And again, that's more and more sin is preached less and less because it makes us uncomfortable. But we should be uncomfortable. Sins should make us uncomfortable because we know that the same way the result of sin for the Israelites in the wilderness was their very real death. The result of our sin is our very real death. If you get uncomfortable hearing and talking about sin the same way that I do. I'm sweating right now. Even though I have no hair, I'm sweating. It makes me uncomfortable. We should be uncomfortable. We should be uncomfortable. It's not until we are uncomfortable that we acknowledge that we have a need. Everything's going along fine until we acknowledge our sin. We cannot acknowledge the fact that we have a need. Uh, quick story. I have... Uh, I don't want to say the word because I don't want to scar uh, children forever and ever, but so I'm going to dance around it, and there is a profession that does stuff to help your teeth. We know the thing I'm talking about? I don't want to say the word uh, because, <laughs> because I also have that fear, and I don't want to impart it onto other people. <laughs> but we, there's that thing, right, that profession, that... Uh, is an evil, evil, no, I'm just kidding. It's a profession that, that does stuff uh, for our oral hygiene. And so because of my own disposition and genetics and that sort of thing, I visit that person a lot. And like, there's a lot of money invested in this thing here. And so uh, <laughs> I had a, a, a root canal. One of those things is great. If you, ever, if you haven't done it, everyone should try it. But <laughs> I've done a couple of them. They're awesome. They get easier and easier. Um, so, so I had that procedure done at one time, um, and relatively recently, uh, the way they do it, most of your tooth is not real anymore, and it kind of came out, like it, you know, there's part still here, and there's part in the trash can, <laughs> and I'm uncomfortable about that, uh, but I have a need. I have to go to this noble profession of people that do things for your oral hygiene. I have to visit them and have this taken care of. I don't want to, but I got it. <laughs> That's, you know, a very trivialized, in reality, uh, analogy to what's happening here. I don't think about that person until I have a need. 
And we won't think about our need until we acknowledge that we have a need. And so when we talk about sin, it's not a discussion of condemnation. It's a discussion of an acknowledgement of our need. And so what do we need? It's an acknowledgement of our Savior. We need a Savior in the same way I need an oral hygiene professional. <laughs> you like the euphemism? It's in the same way I need that. Uh, 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 we need a Savior. It's an acknowledgement that we need them, and it's an acknowledgement that our Savior exists, and that we know who it is, and that we know where he came from, and we know what he did for us. So we move from this valley of shame and sin that we first start in on this slide, and we move to praise and worship. The gospel is meaningless without the acknowledgement of our sin. Until we acknowledge that, we don't acknowledge the need for our Savior, and until we acknowledge the need, we don't acknowledge what our Savior has done for us. And that's a life in the light. That's a life that says, all of these things that I'm holding in me, I'm giving to you, Lord. I'm giving them to you now. I'm exposing them to the light. Exposing all of this uh, to you, Lord. We're carrying this together now. God says, I want to take this from you, but I can't take it from you until you bring it to me. You have to bring it to me. You have to take your eyes off the snakes and put your eyes on what God has done for you. And until that happens, God can't help you. That's life in the light. That's what it means when we say we keep our eyes on Easter. We keep our eyes on the light. We keep our eyes on the fact that God loves us. We keep our eyes on the fact that God loves us so much that he made a way for us. That way is Jesus. So just in the exact same way that the Israelites were called to keep their eyes on the serpent on the pole, we're called to keep our eyes on our Savior that's hanging on the cross. We're called to look up, to keep our eyes on Jesus. Even though we have things within us that we want to hide and expose and keep in the darkness. If we're living in the light, if we have eyes on light, that means we have eyes on Jesus. And ultimately then we have eyes on Easter. The story of Jesus is not a story of God sent his one and only son to die. The story of Easter is God sent his one and only one of a kind super awesome son to die and be raised again. That's eyes on Easter. Because then the consequences of our sin, which we are starting to agree on, the consequence of death that comes from that, eyes on Easter means that that consequence does not apply anymore. That consequence does not apply to us anymore if we keep our eyes on the light, if we keep our eyes on Jesus, and we keep our eyes on on Easter. Amen? Amen. All right. Will you pray with me, please? Let's pray. Uh, God, we thank you for sending your one and only son. We thank you for the sacrifice that he has made. We thank you that you send the Holy Spirit into our lives to help us navigate these questions, to help us navigate the uncertainty, and to help us hold our hands as we walk into the light. So, Lord, We're here now in the light. So I'd like to uh, take a moment here. With our eyes closed to sit in the light of the Lord. And if you're someone that doesn't have that, no matter how many years you have been, uh, quote, coming to church, maybe you've never actually uh, walked into the light. So I invite you to do that now. Maybe you're someone that walks in the light all the time. And so you can help lead us there. You can be our helper also. But Lord, we walk into the light now. This whole mess that you see before you, Lord, we offer to you. Because we know, we have confidence that you love us no matter what you see in us. 
And we give it to you, God. God, help us keep our eyes off the snakes on the ground, off our circumstances of this world, Lord, and help us keep our eyes on Easter. Help us keep our eyes on eternal life. We're here now, Lord, exposed in the light. And we know that you love us. And so in turn, Lord, we love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, amen, amen.